Strange oddities abound throughout Mark's tale. But these oddities become clear once we are able to find Mark's source material. And now, grab your popcorn and dim the lights. I present to you the strange case of the inseparable James and John. The disciples James and John are said to be brothers, the sons of a man named Zebedee. They were, according to Mark, sailors and fishermen. Except for one verse, they are always referred to together and in the same order. Never John and James, always James and John. And going on a little further, he saw James the son of Zebedee and John his brother. And straightway, when they were come out of the synagogue, they came into the house of Simon and Andrew with James and John. And James, the son of Zebedee, and John, the brother of James. And he suffered no man to follow with him, save Peter and James and John, the brother of James. And after six days, Jesus taketh with him Peter and James and John. And there come near unto him James and John, the sons of Zebedee. And when the ten heard it, they began to be moved with indignation concerning James and John. And as he sat on the Mount of Olives, over against the temple, Peter and James and John and Andrew asked him privately. And he taketh with him Peter and James and John. In fact, James is never referred to by himself in the entire gospel, always with John, and John is referred to only once by himself. Mark treats the brothers as if they were one person, not two individuals, always together and even speaking as one person. James and John, the two sons of Zebedee, came up to Jesus saying, Teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask of you. So, why is Mark treating the brothers as if they were Siamese twins joined at the hip? Why the lack of individuality? Mark gives Peter a special place of prominence by having Jesus tell him that his church would be built upon him. And of the big three disciples, Peter is given preference in each scene. It is Peter who recognizes Jesus as the Messiah. It is Peter who speaks up at the transfiguration. It is Peter who most fervently swears his fealty to his master, but tragically fails to keep his promise. Perhaps Mark was simply downplaying the importance of James and John in order to give Peter the title of top disciple. Or perhaps Mark was simply unaware of any details about James and John. Maybe the eldest brother was always referred to first. But I think there's a more powerful explanation which will not only illuminate this treatment of the brothers, but explain some oddities as well, and one verse that has remained a mystery since Mark penned it almost 2,000 years ago. This is a relief showing two young lads with horses. You can see that the sculptor has rendered them as mirror images to reinforce the idea that they were not only brothers, but twins. They are two characters from Greek mythology. Their names are Castor and Polydeuces. They are often depicted with horses and almost always depicted together. The mythology of these two varies, but over time they became viewed as divine and were thought to appear on the rigging of ships in the form of St. Elmo's fire. And were believed to indicate the safe escape from the upcoming storm. This poem from the Homeric Hymns, a collection of ancient hymns to the various Greek gods, recounts the basics of the myth. I'll explain it in a little detail, so don't worry if it all seems confusing at first. Bright-eyed muses, tell of the Tyndaridae, the sons of Zeus, glorious children of neat-ankled Leda, Castor, the tamer of horses, and blameless Polydeuces. When Leda had lain with the dark-clouded son of Kronos, 
she bare them beneath the peak of the great hill Tejidus, children who are deliverers of men on earth and of swift-going ships when the stormy gales rage over the ruthless sea. Then the shipmen call upon the sons of great Zeus with vows of white lambs going to the forepart of the prow, but the strong wind and the waves of the sea lay the ship under water, until suddenly these two are seen darting through the air on tawny wings. Forthwith they allay the blasts of the cruel winds and still the waves upon the surface of the white sea. Fair signs are they and deliverance from toil. And when the shipmen see them, they are glad and have rest from their pain and labor. The Tyndaridae was another name for Castor and Polydeuces, as Castor was fathered by Tyndarius. The other title used for the twins is Sons of Zeus, as Polydeuces was considered to have been fathered by Zeus. One legend says that Zeus disguised as a swan, raped Leda, and she laid four eggs and gave birth to Castor and Polydeuces, as well as Helen and Clytemnestra. Castor and Clytemnestra were thought to be Tyndarius's son and daughter, and they were mortal, while Polydeuces and Helen were thought to be Zeus's son and daughter and immortal. So you'll find Castor and Polydeuces referred to sometimes as the sons of Tyndarius or the Tyndaridae, but more times than not as the Dioscuri, literally Zeus's boys. Castor and Polydeuces are sometimes both mortal, sometimes both divine, but the more well-known tale has Castor being mortal and Polydeuces being immortal. And in the myth, Castor is eventually killed. As a result, Polydeuces then splits half his immortality with his fallen brother, so that Castor spends half his time on Mount Olympus and half of his time in Hades, as does Polydeuces. The brothers became part of the stellar constellation Gemini, which is Latin for twins, becoming the two brightest stars in the group, Castor, or Alpha Geminorum, and Pollux, which is the Latin name for Polydeuces, Beta Geminorum. The question is, was Mark mimicking the common and widespread Greek myth of the Dioscuri by depicting James and John as a Christianized version of Castor and Polydeuces, inseparable and indistinct, mirror images of each other, and in the same way James and John are always referred to in the same order, Castor and Polydeuces were never called Polydeuces and Castor, always Castor and Polydeuces. But here is where it gets interesting. Remember the scene where James and John ask to sit at the left and right hand of Jesus? James and John, the two sons of Zebedee, came up to Jesus saying, Teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask of you. And he said to them, What do you want me to do for you? They said to him, Grant that we may sit, one on your right and one on your left, in your glory. Did you notice how neither of them seemed to care whether they actually got the left or the right position, even though the right position was normally associated with a higher place of honor? Sitting at the right hand of a deity would have been the best seat in the house, but according to Mark, neither John nor James showed the slightest interest in the right position. Again, they are depicted as one person instead of two distinct brothers who we know would have been fighting over that right hand spot. Mark has given us another Homeric flag in this passage. The brothers are requesting to flank Jesus at the left and the right, a deity flanked by twins. The twins, Castor and Polydeuces, are seen in these images as flanking a deity, one of the brothers on the left and one on the right. Here, they are seen with Helen of Troy, who is believed to be the daughter of Zeus and as such, 
a demigod or immortal. Another depicts them at the left and right of Zeus. And here are two instances where the Dioscuri flank Astarte. In this picture, they flank Serapis. This image shows them flanking Saturn. And here is one where they flank Jupiter. And here is another where they flank Jupiter. And here is another showing the twins at the left and right of Artemis. And one more showing them flanking Artemis. And this one is perhaps Heracles. And one with Helios. And here is another showing them at the left and right hand of Juno. Castor and Polydeuces, the Dioscuri, flanking various deities. This would explain why Mark depicted John and James as twins requesting to flank a deity, with no care as to which side was which. It appears that Mark was indeed superimposing the well-known myth of Castor and Polydeuces onto James and John and inventing the details based on the mythology rather than giving us actual historical events. But there's one final oddity that I've deliberately saved for last. It is another Homeric flag by Mark, and this time an explicit one that none of his readers could have missed. And it only appears in the Gospel of Mark. For Mark's readers, it was a very important flag early on in his story so that they would not miss his reference to the mythological twins. And James the son of Zebedee, and John the brother of James, and he surnamed them Boanerges, which is the sons of thunder. The twins, Castor and Polydeuces, were known collectively as the Dioscuri, which means the sons of Zeus. Zeus was known as the god of thunder and the thundering one. And Zeus's father, Kronos, was known as the father of thunder. Castor and Polydeuces, the Dioscuri, or literally, Zeus's boys. Mark has given his readers an easy flag with which to recognize his Christianized version of the Dioscuri in his own work. James and John, the sons of thunder, Zeus's boys. The mythical Greek twins known as the Dioscuri. I'd like to tell you one final parallel concerning James and John and Castor and Polydeuces. It's interesting to know that James was thought to have been martyred and John was believed to have been immortal by some early Christians. Castor, James's counterpart, was mortal and was killed by the sword just like James. Polydeuces was immortal just like John was believed to be. And lastly, remember when James and John asked Jesus, collectively, to sit at his right and left hand in his glory, and Jesus replied to them that it wasn't his to give them, and that it would be given to them for whom it had been prepared. Now, remember the thieves on the cross? One on his left and one on his right. That's a literary author at work, foreshadowing, fiction flowing from the pen of Mark. James and John could not share Jesus' death as they and all the others would forsake him. But instead, Jesus shares his moment of glory with two common criminals, which would spark the reader's memory about what Jesus had told James and John earlier. His right and left were not his to give.